The reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 through 22 uh, to end of that chapter. So, verse 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eyes are their eye is on you and to curry their favor but but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the lord whatever you do work at it with all your heart as working for the lord not human masters since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the lord as a reward it is the Lord Christ you are serving. A pleasant morning to everyone and to those who are joining us online. May the Lord's grace and peace be with you. The title of the sermon today is Your Work, Your Mission Field. In our text, Paul shows how Christian servants and masters should relate to one another. Interestingly, Paul devotes more space to this topic than he does to the relationships between husbands and wives or parents and children. Paul elevates all work, whether manual labor or management, by saying that whatever we do, we should do it heartily as unto the Lord, not for man. While Paul's commands are to Christian slaves and masters, they also apply to Christian employees and employers. He is showing how the Lord Christ affects relationships in the workplace. Employees will work with sincerity and employers will be just and fair. In line with our sermon today, let me ask this question, why work? and share some probable answers. Why work? Because God is a worker. From the opening pages of God's word, it is obvious that God is a worker, that he is a God who is busy, a God who is in the mood. In Genesis chapter one in verse one, tells us in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. Why work? Because our God is a worker. Psalms 19 in verse 1 tells us, The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show it His handiwork. And in Psalms 104 in verse 24 it says, How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you meet them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Our God is a worker, and we, according to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, are created in his very own image. Therefore, we are to be workers. In fact, in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 15, tells us, after creating the first man, immediately put in the garden of Eden to work and take care of it. Why work? because our Lord Jesus is a worker. When the Lord wore flesh and walked this earth, he was also a worker. I mean, until he was 30 years old, Jesus worked as a carpenter like his earthly father, Joseph. And in John chapter five, we read how he also worked like his heavenly father. In verse 17, he said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. In John chapter 4, in verse 24, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Why work? Because of the blessing of work. 
We all know that hard work and dedication is the way to success. But the path isn't always easy or exactly clear. This is a part of life. But the Bible is here to guide and motivate us during even toughest of times. God wants us to thrive in all aspects of our lives and he gave us the tools, talents, and gifts to do just that. So then even in dark and confusing times, do whatever is needed without hesitation. In Psalms chapter 128 verse 1 and 2 says, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. You will eat the fruit of your labor, blessing and prosperity will be yours. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 23 says, All hard work brings a profit, but mere talks leads only to poverty. God rewards those who work. The promise is that labor shall be fruitful and that who performs it shall himself enjoy the recompense of it. God crowns every honest and faithful effort of man with success. Industry is crowned with God's blessing. Why work? Because of the benefit of work. In 2006, the Department for Work and Pensions published an independent review of the evidence supporting the relationship between work, health, and well-being. This review sets out to answer the question, is work good for your health and well-being? And according to them, working whether paid or unpaid is good for our health and well-being. It contributes to our happiness help us to build confidence and self-esteem and rewards us financially. Being in work keeps us busy, challenges us and gives us the means to develop ourselves, gives us personal achievements, enables us to socialize, build contacts and find support, provides us with money to support ourselves and explore our interests. The next point to present is all work is ministry. All work is service. In Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 28 tells us, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. According to this verse, you work, your work serve others in two ways. First, you have to do something useful. All work that is honest, moral, and lawful would fall under the category of useful. Second, this teaches you to serve others through your work. When you work, you are either providing services or products to other people need, or providing basic necessities for yourself. You work first of all so that you will not depend on others, but God wants you to take that additional step where you order your finances in such a way that you can also help those who are in need. A preacher said, Christianity is not just a nice Sunday theory. It applies directly to our work whether you are an employee or employer. We tend to think of ministry as the work we do in the church rather than the work we do in the world. We divide life into sacred and the secular, but God view it all as one. Ministry simply means serving the Lord, and you can do that at church, but you can do it at your place work. So you might be a minister of gospel, but you could also be a minister of accounting or a minister of daycare or a minister of plumbing. Martin Luther wrote, the idea that service to God should have only to do with the church altar, singing, reading, sacrifice, and the like, is without doubt but the worst trick of the devil. How could the devil have led us more effectively astray than by the narrow conception that the service of God takes place only in the church and by works done therein? The whole world could abound with services to the Lord, not only in churches, but also in the home, kitchen, workshop, and field. 
We are all ministers as we serve the Lord, both here in the church and in place where God has called you to work. Don't think of your job as just a job. View your work as God's calling. Whether you are a mother, a contractor, or a student, when you see your work as ministry, your work takes a new significance. In Acts 20, verse 35, Apostle Paul said, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. So whatever work you find yourself in, praise God that you have the opportunity to serve others because you work as serving the Lord. Someone said that he, that he would have been pleased to have blown the bellows for Handel, to have picked up the fallen brass for Michelangelo, to have held the spyglass for Christopher Columbus, or to have carried Shakespeare's bag, but to be serving Christ, that is the highest distinction. The next point is from our assigned text. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 to 23. This talks about how you work matters. It says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to carry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. We were created to work. It's true and it is part of God's plan of creation. Work is a place God used us as Christians to influence our fallen world. Work is a place where we make a difference for the kingdom of God. We are created to contribute to our society for the good. So as we discuss the truths of this passage today, do not assign these traits or qualities to just work. Instead, all work should be motivated by the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. The first quality mentioned is submission. Slaves, obey your earthly masters and everything. Submission means obeying or willing to obey, complying with or submissive to authority. Paul tells us to demonstrate our submission by obeying our bosses. It is an attitude that any true Christian has adopted into their lives, for Paul referred to us as his slaves of Christ. In Romans chapter 6 verse 22 says, Now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. If we are slaves to Christ, we understand submission, and we should model it in the world daily as we live. In addition, Paul even broadens our obedience to everything or every area. Having said that, we need to understand that what Paul is writing excludes breaking the commands of God. He means obey all things pertaining to one's occupation. Today, very few people have ever been enslaved like those whom Paul was addressing here. However, most of us work for a living, and the principle holds true for that area. We do it not because the other person is better, not because we are cowards, not because we are weak, not because the authority was great, not because the person was better man or woman. In fact, it had nothing to do whatsoever with the character of the person in authority. Our submission has everything to do with our relationship to God. Submitting was done out of respect for God, what we know of Him, and the purpose He is working on. Having the attitude of submission is being like Christ. Christ modeled submission like no other, and we should strive to model it in our working lives as well. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 to 20 tells us, Slaves in reverent fear of God, 
Submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. In 1 Timothy 6.1, all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Having a submission attitude at work gives the people around us a clear picture of who Christ is and how we submit to him. We are showing people Christ so we do not give them the reason to attack or slander our Lord and King. The second quality or traits in verse 22 still is properly motivated. Not only when their eye is on you. In the King James Version it says, not with eye service as men pleasers. There are two motivations Paul wants us to see. A wrong motivation for work and right motivation. The wrong motivation is to work with impure motive and a wrong focus. Paul calls eye service. It is when we try and get away with working only when the boss is loaded and slacking the rest of time. I picture a number of office workers near their cubicles standing around talking over coffee until the boss walks in. And they, they scurry like cockroaches when you turn on the light. Another wrong motivation is to work with an incorrect focus. Paul used the phrase, men pleasers. We focus sometimes on pleasing man to earn his approval and respect. Man pleasing is a part of our old nature. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, he said, Am I now trying to win the approval of human being or of God? Or I am trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul is clarifying that pleasing man is not a quality of the nature of a Christian. No matter how good or bad your job may be, it will not matter if you turn your focus to please God over man. The next quality is integrity, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Integrity means be honest in your work. Be above board with your boss, with your clients, and in all your transactions. Working with integrity means you are a whole person. You are not one person in one situation and different person in another. Also means doing the right thing even when others may pressure us to do otherwise. Living and working as if Jesus himself was with you right every step of the way. The next trait is hurting. Verse 23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Most translations are going to translate this, do your work heartily or from the heart. But you would be interested to know that this phrase does not contain the Greek word for heart cardia, but the word suke, translated so. However, most commentators agree that this phrase is equivalent to in the heart, or they are used frequently side by side. So example in Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 16, after Moses reads to Israel the commandments of God, he says, the Lord your God commands you this day to follow these decrees and laws and carefully observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. With all your heart and soul means that we are to love, serve, and work with everything we have emotionally and physically. This explained by Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your mind. 
So the next point is first 24. Your work, your mission field. It says, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. This is awesome truth for all believers around the world. It's an incredible revelation knowing that the Lord will reward us for the work we do here on earth. Paul tells these slaves who were often regarded as a piece of property, it is the Lord whom you serve. When and where did they serve him? They probably put in 80 to 100 hours a week serving their masters. They had no free time as we know it today. They were probably restricted in attending church services. So when did they serve the Lord Christ? The answer is, they served Christ while they were fulfilling their duties on the job as servants. By their distinctive work habits and perhaps their work effort, their trusted work as a Christian honors God and brings glory to his name. They were Christ's representatives. Their workplace was their mission field. While Paul's commands are to Christian slaves and masters, though not an exact equivalent, similar principles also apply to those in a modern-day work context between employer and employee. God has placed you at the workplace where you are for to a specific reason. Maybe it is to develop your character, your talent, or to prepare you for next assignment. One reason you can be sure is that God has where you are, so that he will have a light that will hopefully draw people to him in order that they may be saved. To be a witness to people that no pastor, preacher, or missionary has contact with, Many of your co-workers never read the Bible, but they read you every day. They should be able to see that there's something different about you. Like you don't laugh at the dirty jokes. You don't join the guys in commenting on the finer points of woman's anatomy. You don't run others behind their back. You're honest and trustworthy. As Christian and your job as your mission field, let people know that your faith in Jesus affects your whole life, including your work. I remember Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and they glorify your Father who is in heaven. There are countless people in our society who will never consider going to church on a Sunday morning. For them, Sunday is the day to go to the lake, work on the yard, wash the car, clean the house, sleep in. Is the message of God's love and redemption ever going to reach them? Yes, God has his people going out to them, working beside them, working for them, going to school with them, being taught by them. Yes, God has his personal representatives going out to nearly every place in this world. Those who know him, love him, been saved by him, rubbing shoulders with people who need the gospel. When we think of the hundreds of encounters that we all make each week at work and school, with lost, hurting people, with people who so desperately need the experience to experience the love of God. With people who need to know that even in a world full of chaos, there is great, good, and powerful God who is able to restore and his glory fills the earth. With people who are facing a Christless eternity and who may only be a conversation away from his grace. I believe that if we will allow ourselves to be seized by the truth, that we are there for a huge and eternal purpose, amazing things will happen. Regardless of our work situation, 
the instruction in the Bible remains the same. We must do our best as if we were working for the Lord himself. We should know that the Lord put us where we are for a reason. We know there are lost and hurting people that we will encounter every week. It's our prayer that may God help us to not only see them, but help us to seize the opportunity to show God's love and share the gospel. Amen.